Hello, how are you? I'm really well, how are you? Uh, not too bad. I think the, the, um, the normal way of saying it now, as everybody's telling me, not too bad in the circumstances. <laughs> Do you mind if I put this on Instagram as well? No problem, no problem. I think this is going to be the, uh, basically the future of us. Our, our interaction will be through these sort of Zoom conferences. Did you see that? I'll send you that little film uh, I got of these four guys trying to do a, um, a virtual conference. I'll, I'll, it's very funny. I'm, really, you can post that on I'm your actually, Instagram. you know, like Shari and a, a bunch of my friends in London, they've actually asked if we want to do a, um, a Zoom, like cigar smoking session or whatever, which I think will be quite entertaining. Now, how's there everything doing? How are you? How are you, my friend? Well, I, you know, I came back from the UK, so um, I, and it was, it was, it's considered by Singapore to be kind of a high risk area. So I had to go immediately into 14 day quarantine, which um, I've realized actually that uh, I'm not that crazy about myself, you know, spending too much time with myself can be quite irritating. <laughs> like, <laughs> let, let, let me lend you my two kids for a few days <laughs> and then you will notice how great it is to be all alone. No worries. No, yeah. Absolutely right. It was very funny because I was reading this story by um, this author, Tom Jones, from his, uh, The Pugil's Arrest, and it was talking about Robinson Crusoe. And apparently Robinson Crusoe was in the Royal Navy, and you know, but he was a real pain in the ass. And at some point, you know, he was just bitching all the time about how he couldn't take it anymore. And then they saw an island. They were like, okay, you know what? If you, you can't take it on this ship anymore, go to that island. So he went to the island. Um, they rode off in kind of like this irate fervor and he, you know, there he, you know, eventually transformed from this really irritating kind of like a, a naysayer into someone who had to, buy, to survive and to, had to enjoy his own company and it became kind of like this existential experience for him. And eventually he became kind of like this Nietzschean Uberman capable of like running down goats and, you know, tearing them apart and eating them and, and surviving in all these amazing ways. And then... Uh, he got picked up by the world Navy because they were like, well, we should go and see if he's still alive and brought back to, um, to believe in England. And apparently he was miserable for the rest of his life. So, <laughs> so maybe, maybe when we, uh, this all goes back to normal, we're going to be like, oh my God, I was so much happier when I was by myself. <laughs> well, one thing is sure, we're at a pivotal moment of humanity. Indeed, indeed, sir. But uh, and how's everything in Dubai? How are you, sir? Uh, good. Um... I must admit, um, when I closed the company in Switzerland on Wednesday last week, it took me a good five days to get out of a depressed mode. Right. Um, I mean, for 15 years, and actually even for 22 years, if you add Harry Winston, I've been, um, every time we've had a hard moment, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, you know, you just, you work, you, you, you go out there, you, you manage to find solutions, and that's what I do, I'm a doer. And for the first time in my life, I can't do anything. And it just, it just dawned on me. I was like, oh, oh my God, I, I can't sit on the sidelines. And then you just have to accept. Exactly. You have to sit on the sidelines. And that's probably the, the toughest part from the last week. Now I'm yeah. getting to touch with it. Yeah. And um, what I don't understand is that <laughs> I, my company's theoretically in hibernation, even though we just launched Bulldog. And of course, we're so much more in contact with people than we were before because before right. everything used to work as it's, it's, it's like when you do bicycle, when you're on your bicycle, you don't think how you have to ride a bicycle. Now it's as if you're teaching yourself another sort of bicycle and you're thinking all the time. So it's another part of your brain, which is all the time. Every new question is, is, is a new paradigm. You're like, how am I going to solve that one? Um, so that's, I'll, I'll just put it as interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, the other thing is um, I was not very much a, tele a phone guy. Uh, yeah. I was very much in contact with people if I was um, through email, WhatsApp, whatever, and extremely short, extremely precise, extremely um, focused. Yeah. And you realize now, no, no, no. If you care for people, you can't do that. Absolutely. You just can't, uh, and suddenly I'm, I'm, I'm picking up my phone and I'm speaking to them. Right. And we're talking about stuff, random stuff. And, and that's incre incredibly um, time consuming, but it's incredibly important. So right. I am completely swamped, even though the company <laughs> is basically just operating at 10% of what it used to be. Well, you know, it's interesting what you were saying, because I think you and I, our natural inclination is when things go tits up is that we go out there and hustle, right? But you're absolutely right. The best thing that we can possibly do 
is uh, just to stay at home right now. And that's a very important message to send to everyone right now. Please stay at home. Please uh, avoid any kind of social gatherings. We have to flatten the curve of this infection. And, uh, you know, and, and hopefully we can all regroup when times are better. But let's talk a little bit about what you were first saying. You know, 22 years ago, uh, you were the you were the CEO, young CEO at Harry Winston, um, and I think this is a great way to start into this story because basically I th I consider you to be the father of independent watchmaking, right? Well, I mean, okay, you're not an independent watchmaker, but you were the guy who basically were the first person to put them on the stage to shine the spotlight on them and to say, wow, look at what these guys are doing. And you did this in some ways out of necessity, out of, but also in some ways as a brilliant stroke of genius, as far as you know, from my perspective. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, out of necessity, yes. A genius, absolutely not. Um, Very modest. I think everything I'm realizing now, I'm not now just because of what's happening in the world, but now the last years, which has happened to me in life, is a question of karma. And uh, I have been brought to do things which were seminal for me and were in my building process. And um, I think meeting up with François Paul Jaune um, 23 years ago and all these other independent watchmakers when I took over Harry Winston, which was in a disastrous situation, um, was, was probably what was going to turn my life around, was probably one of going to turn Harry Winston's life at some point at least, um, maybe independent watchmaking. I recognized something which made my heart resonate at the same level. It was something which I felt attracted to. It could be like the Bermuda Triangle. You don't know where the hell you're going and you don't know if you're going to disappear in that frigging hole. But you, you, you get sucked in and you do not know why. And especially when I was 30, I had no idea why I was doing whatever I was doing. Um, at 50, I know a little bit more, but not much more. Um, and, um, and so I just got attracted by it. I wanted to do something with Transat Paul. I wanted to do something with Vianney, with Felix. With, it, seemed, it seemed right. Uh, of course, um, it was good for Harry Winston. Of course, it was good for them. It was a perfect karma combination. You help other people. It helps you help yourself. Um, but I just... I did stuff like I do much more even. I usually, I'm sorry, it's a really long-winded uh, answer. Um, oh, I, it's a really long answer, sorry. But um, I, used to, I used to be extremely cerebral. Everything I did was, was intellectualized and it was thought over. And I wouldn't give any space to my guts because I didn't trust my guts and I, didn't, I, wasn't, I was very insecure. And so... I think Opus is one of the very few um, actions I took where my gut spoke and I actually couldn't even really explain it to anybody, my team or the, Mr. Winston, like, let's try and do it. We probably won't lose too much money was my pitch. Uh, and uh, and, and it, it changed my life. And, but going forward, a lot of those gut feeling ideas are going to change my life. Would you say that Opus taught you to trust your instincts a little bit more and to kind of go with your gut? It, it definitely did. It also um, made me discover a world of entrepreneurs who didn't give a F about mm. what clients wanted or what the market wanted. It was the first time I, I was brought up in a culture where First, we had to save Jaeger Le Coult 30, 29 years ago when I entered. There was no luxury of, let's just do something. Maybe it will not sell at all. We had to really think, how are we going to save that company? So you've got immense responsibilities on your shoulder, and you can't just screw around. Um, even though we did a lot of errors, and those errors taught us a lot of things. But we're always thinking market. And, um, and here, for the first time, I'm meeting people, entrepreneurs, creators who were, you know what? I just need to do this. I have no idea if anybody's ever going to buy it, but I have to do it. And I think that was the, that was, that, that was the moment. That, that is, that's the moment which is going to define me in the rest of my life. All right. Because that's what I did seven years later, now 15 years ago with, uh, with MBNF, is I don't give a damn if anybody's going to buy this. 
but I have to do it. I have to try. Now I want to switch over to MBNF pretty soon, but I'm going to ask one last question about um, the Opus collection. So for those of you guys logging on, just to, to remind you, if you're not, if you don't remember, is that when Max was the um, CEO of Harry Winston, he basically, uh, I would say, fathered the whole you know new world of independent watchmaking by creating a project called Opus. And Opus was a feature collaboration between Harry Winston and an independent watchmaker like François Paul Journe or Antoine Prezuzio or Vianney Holter or Felix Baumgartner, who um, have now become horological legends, as a result um, of this, the platform that was given to them by, by uh, Max. Now, Max, you, you mentioned what you found interesting was artists who only wanted to create it almost for the pure sake of art. Of all of the opuses, which one do you think expresses that? I know which one I think it, it is, but which one do you feel expresses that the most? Are we talking generally or of the five opuses I worked on? On the five opuses that you worked on. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, it has to be opus three. Of course. It, it has to be <laughs> opus three. I mean, like, opus three took 10 years. <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> come from idea to delivering the first piece. I was yeah. long gone from Harry Winston. Right. Um, it was an insane idea. And I have to give kudos to the, the owners of Harry Winston at that time who um, continued the project and must yeah. have lost millions over millions <laughs> over each so of these pieces they delivered. And not right. only did they continue but 10 years later when they deliver the piece they delivered it at the original retail price which was probably less than a quarter of what it should have retailed for so yeah uh, i think it, it it demonstrates more than anything else the the vision of uh, of a group of people who wanted to try something which had never been done where the retailers looked at us and going who's ever going to buy this uh, and I will not mention names, uh, and, um, <laughs> and, and I was like, ah, oh, $70,000, but that's the price of a perpetual calendar. Nobody's ever going to buy this. Yeah. And, um, and so just continuing, falling down, not managing to make it work, then trying with another group of watchmakers, that fails, trying with a third group of watchmakers, yes. and just putting... 10 years, 10 years of R&D. Wow. And finally the piece comes out. Unfortunately, people now don't really know about this piece. They don't understand it. It looks very small. When we came out with it, it was considered a monster. It was, so <laughs> uh, uh, it was 2003, yeah. And, right. um, and yeah, it's, I think it's part of what, what makes me love this industry now don't get me wrong i do not love 10 years of war <laughs> and horrible uh, developments which don't which fail but right. that is our life that's what we're about so uh, well what i you know i love about uh, opus 3 is the sheer ambition of it um obviously it was given birth to by Vianney holter uh, and well it was conceptualized by Vianney holter i think ultimately was it aprmp that finally figured it out it was or? indeed uh, aprp uh, who finalized it yeah Amazing. Okay, well, you know, let's um, go back now, well, even uh, still quite a few years ago to this wonderful um, film festival in Tarmina. <laughs> and uh, then I remember we were having breakfast and, on, on this lovely terrace by the ocean. And you, uh, you walked over and I was like, hey, Max, how, how are you? Um, and you said, hey, let's have a coffee. So we, we sat down and I remember you saying that you had tendered your resignation because you had a dream to create. And, you know, tell me a little bit about why you feel, because you could have stayed in this very cushy job. You could have made probably, you know, maybe even more money, you know, um, I, I don't know. Definitely. Maybe. Oh, definitely. <laughs> um, uh, you could have had this extremely glamorous life, you know, um, but what made you want to be, do your own thing, be, be your own man? Um, yeah, look, I've, I've told the story a few times. Um, I come from a family with no money. I uh, never ambitioned ever in my life to be CEO of anything. It was not even on the radar. It's not, it's not something you, you actually think you'll ever achieve. Um, I, I took over Harry Winston timepieces in 98 when it was virtually bankrupt and Harry Winston was virtually bankrupt. And um, we managed to turn that company around with a little team which was there with no help from anybody on the 
degree. And, um, and then over the next five years from 2000, 2005, we, we grew it to, it was incredible. I mean, from eight to $80 million, we created the Opus, we created the manufacturer, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it's, uh, it's, I should have been the happiest man around. I had my face in newspapers. I had a massive salary. Um, I, um, I, I couldn't understand while this was happening, why every morning it was more difficult for me to go to the office. And uh, yeah, sure. I, I was enjoying the life and I probably became quite a prick. Uh, I, um, I, I, I didn't, I don't like the man I was in those days. And, uh, Being a, a, a prick, you and, know, you seem all seem very nice. And so I was just, I was very self-centered. And okay. I think um, then, then, uh, well, my dad passed away and a couple, a year later, I decided to go into therapy to, to deal with that because I really couldn't deal with that. And there we worked on regrets and of course, regrets of me and my dad. Um, and uh, suddenly the, the therapist and I often quote this incredible moment of my life because I think it's very important for everybody the, the therapist asked me, so if you walk out of the session, get hit by a bus now, You've got two minutes to live. What other regrets do you have? And probably she was trying to steer me away from my dad after about <laughs> a year and a half. And, sure. um, and, and I realized I hated my life. I hated myself. I, um, I felt I'd sold out. Wow. The, the, the little boy, when I was a kid, who was very artistic, very creative, and that was actually my savior because I was very lonely. Um, had sold out, I'd become a marketeer. I'd spent my, my whole f professional life creating watches, but always creating watches for the market. And it was a total abnegation of who I am, of what I love, what I want to try. Most of the pieces I, I created, I probably didn't even like. And, um, and I looked at myself, I, like, I hate myself. The other thing is I realized that um, my parents, even though I didn't really get along with my dad, but that's a whole other feature. Um, my parents were probably the, the kindest and, and most respectful people I've met and always tried to give me the, the great values of humanity and treat people the way you want to be treated, etc. And that uh, in work life, in business life, it was incredibly difficult to abide by those rules. And everybody thought it was okay to be um, free for all and everybody backstabbing everybody. And I was like, you know what? I can't go on like this. I don't want to work with half the people I'm working with. At any around, clients, retailers, suppliers, people in the company. I was like, I don't want to work with these people. They're horrible people. And, um, and that's what basically was going to define at some point um, MBNF. And it was MBNF was supposed to be B and F, not MBNF. It was going to be Booster and Friends. Okay. And... Um, and so, sorry, I'm gonna to have to just take a pause. Can you just take a pause? Yeah, One of minute. course. Yeah. Of course. Well, while, while we're here, we can uh, take a look at my watch. So this is the new uh, Yellow Gold, well, they, they launched, I guess it launched about a month ago, Yellow Gold and Blue Base Plate, play, um, yeah. Max Buser and Friends, Legacy Machine, Perpetual Calendar, which I love. I was showing you how to watch. When you've got. But <laughs> legacy machine. Watch. Aha! Well done. <laughs> and I have almost like a third owner here, like because uh, I have my cigar case that's got a picture of Shari on it. <laughs> uh, Shari. <laughs> so sorry so, about that. I've just got two kids running around screaming, so I just had to close the. the not at all. Not at all. No, so you, yeah, please continue. You know, um, you were so, saying. Okay, so. I am. Um, that, that's when I realized in, in that, that session that I had to change something in my life. Um, and actually what actually has happened since is that the, I always now, whatever decision I take, try and see if it's something I think I will be proud of in five years, 10 years or 20 years. Right. And it completely changes your life, especially in business, because you'll always have that decision okay we could make more money but we're not really proud of it and 
we could probably make less money or no money at all, but wow, wouldn't we be proud of that? <laughs> sure. And, and wow, you, I don't even think it's a natural. Now it's a natural. So at every crossroad, and they all the time crossroads at every single part of your life, boom, proud, proud, proud. And that has completely brought me on a completely different track. Um, not only, of course, creatively, but more importantly, human on a human basis. The people I work with, the decisions I take, the, um, I mean, look at what's happening to us now. Um, the decisions I'm taking with, with what I'm doing with the company is just there so that every guy in the, in the company keeps their job. Okay, I'm going to probably lose my pension fund, but it's okay. Um, you don't think like that normally. I mean, some people luckily do. So, so there you go. So that's, um, that, is, that is what changed my life. And at some point, I started dreaming of what was going to be MBNF. And um, I have to actually uh, thank my then CEO, who gave me my new contract in um, April 2005. I was going to actually leave in 2006. Right. And uh, that was the plan. But actually, you know, you never really leave because when you've got a good thing going on and you're like, am I going to let this go? Am I really going to let this go? So you procrastinate. And you're like, I'll, I'll do it next year. I'll do it next year. <laughs> and, um, and then um, my CEO gives me at the end of a, a director's board in, in Miami, my new contract. And he says, oh, I think you're going to like it. I'm like, oh, thank you very much knowing very well that next year I am leaving the company. And, um, <laughs> and so um, it takes me like a week. I don't even look at the contract. It's like one of those typical American contracts, like 25 pages where I, I need a lawyer to explain every phrase. And, um, and so I'm, um, I'm reading this contract on a, on a Saturday at home. And it was, it was a great contract. I mean, it had a, a stock options. It had a 12 month severance uh, package. It had, it was like, Wow, it was really, um, and I was the only one of the old team, if I'm not wrong, which had actually kept on. And, right. um, and I arrive at the last page, the 25th page, and there is non-compete, non-solicitation of the suppliers who work with Harry Winston, and impossible to hire anybody from the team if you leave. Wow. Now, <laughs> I have, in my mind, in 2006, one year later, uh, right. I'm going to create a watch brand, <laughs> going to yeah. work, of course, with all the people, all the suppliers and artisans I'd been working with at Harry Winston. And of course, right. at the beginning, I was going to hire anybody because I didn't have any money. But two three years down the road, I was hoping to be able to take somebody from my team, which I built myself from scratch. Um, so here I am looking at this page going, now what am I going to do? And... Um, that's when it all happened. So I have, to, I have to thank that CEO because then I said, okay, it's now. I, have to, I can't sign this contract, so it's now. So a couple of weeks later, I was going to actually to a board meeting to finalize the, um, the new manufacture of Plan Watt because it still didn't exist in those days. It was all, it was the signing off of the budget and I tendered my resignation to everybody's um, shock. So um, that contract allowed me to start in 2005, that contract saved me because <laughs> I, I started in 2005 instead of six or seven or whatever, I would have had really found the courage to do it. Yeah. And therefore, when 2009 hit, yeah. I had already under our belt HM1, HM2, and I was launching HM3. Right. If I had not started in 2005 and I started later, we probably would have been wiped out during that crisis. Course. So again, karma. I mean, it's amazing also because I, when you think about it today, the majority, I would say 90% of like the, you know, independent watchmakers that re really resonate with people, with collectors, and of course I would include you as one of these, were created before the financial crisis. You know, I think there's one or two ex exceptions, but other than that, it was those guys, and a lot of those guys came from Opus, thanks to you, but it was those guys. And now it's so hard, I would imagine, for someone to come into this. But also, it's hard also for someone to express a, a unique identity. You know, now, now for you, I, I always think of you and, and Richard, uh, Richard Mill as being quite interesting because you guys came at it not necessarily as watchmakers, but as guys that had a very specific vision. I think Richard's was to connect the, um, the watchmaking to the world at that point in aerospace. And I think you wanted to create an artistic interpretation of time, right? Tell me a little bit about, um, and I, I think the Bulldog is a great uh, kind of, 
a watch to symbolize your journey, but that's probably why you created it, <laughs> because it's kind of the convergence of, of two families of watches that you've created now, um, and both of which are iconic, both of, one of which was, I think, quite expected of you, and another one of which was, was totally unexpected of you, which is, but has now become something that is, well, I'm wearing one, so it's one of my favorite watches as well. So let's talk maybe first about the horological machines and, and what the impetus was behind the creation of those. Um, I, uh, at the beginning of the journey, I, I had basically, and I have to give kudos again to, to Vianney Halter and to Felix Baumgartner, uh, which had worked on Opus 3 and Opus 5 and who respectively created the Antiqua and the 103. Um, they opened my mind and my, my, my world to what I will call 3D kinetic art, which gives time. Uh, I didn't have that idea all by my own. They're the ones who gave it to me. I also have to thank uh, Rolf Schneider and Ludwig Axelin with The Freak. Oh, and yeah. Of course, I have to thank Amazing. Richard Mill with his RM001, which when he came out, I was like, whoa, this is incredible. And um, so those trailblazers set the scene for, on which I wanted to play. I was like, that, that's, that's what I want to do. I don't want to do all that, the rest. I, I, want, to, I want to be like those guys. And, um, and so HM1 and HM2 and all, it's all these horological machines. It, for me, it's watchmaking is art, is kinetic art. And if it is art, why are 99% of all watches more or less the same with a dial and hands, etc.? And right. I wanted to create those 3D kinetic art pieces which give time. And when I started off MBNF, uh, it was clear that I would never, ever do a round watch again. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I think there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of uh, anger against me, myself. There was that anger against my industry because we were just not being creative. And, um, and so I wanted to go and create my kinetic art pieces. That was the horological machines. What I realized going forward creating the HMs is that they were basically inherently part of my psychotherapy. Right. Every single piece um, started off as being me revisiting my childhood. It wasn't done on purpose. Uh, I would actually, initially, I would sketch and draw pieces. And then when I found something which actually made me happy, I would go further in it. Mm -hmm. But it was never, oh, let's do a spaceship. Or let's right. do a plane. And if, if I show you the sketches of HM4, the Thunderbolt, which is probably one of the most defining pieces of our MBNF era, um, yeah. I, <laughs> it started off as a more or less flat watch with um, two, uh, it was actually two dials and one balance wheel at the center. Oh. And, um, and then slowly, uh, a bit like, you know, those, those designs where you have the ape becoming the human being, the, the theory <laughs> of evolution. So yes. slowly, slowly, those dials started getting a little bit out, a bit like, like the, the fish or the frog coming out of water. It's like, right. uh, and, and then, and they were at, at, the, at the back, and they were at the back, and you had the balance wheel in front, and yeah. they were getting more and more high. I was like sketching, well, let's get them a little bit more higher, and there was an angle. And then finally, I was like, ah, oh, this doesn't work. Let's put the dials in front, and yes. put the balance wheel behind. And then they became vertical. <laughs> and then one day, and poor Eric Giroux, with whom I've been working all my pieces since the beginning, inception of MBNF, was going completely bananas because you imagine, <laughs> so I'm making you draw this and then that and then this and then that. And then I'm like, you know what? Oh, wouldn't it be cool if, if it looks like a, a reactor? And that's how it became that. It didn't start off its life as, oh, I used to make model airplanes when I was a kid. Let's do something which looks like an airplane. So it, horological machines are my psychotherapy. Okay. Um, you mentioned a couple of the horological machines. Let's, let's talk briefly about a few of them. So let's talk maybe first uh, about three because it has a lot of relevance to the 10. Um, and then let's talk about four because that was really, to, as I would say, not only def definitive of, of MBNF, but definitive of the entire era of contemporary watchmaking. I mean, that, that was quite a, a unique watch, um, a really incredibly cool watch. And yeah, let's start with those two, if you don't mind. So the, maybe we'll start with three, which, uh, and then there was a second version called the Frog as well, which I really liked. Tell so us a bit about HM, that. HM3 um, started its life because I 
it's the beginning of my um, of, of of my idea, my my I'll call it my uh, fetishism of showing the movement and showing the balance wheel and the regulator. Right. And it actually started off with me seeing the uh, François Paul Jones resonance for the first time in ah. the year uh, 2000, where I saw that movement and I was like, oh my God, isn't that stunning? Those two balance wheels, the, the movement, the architecture. And I actually created HM3 to have a resonance Jean movement in it. Wow. A lot of things are coming out now. I'm allowing myself to tell stories that wow. I didn't use. That's to incredible. Tell. I have no idea. So I actually so, went to see François Paul with yeah. a movement up of a resonance upside down. And actually the two cones were going to be, of course, they were not yet cones in those days. There were about two indicators were going to be the two hours and minutes because I wanted wow. to see the movement. And François Paul, uh, good friend, just looked at me and said, no. And, uh, and so, well, well that, that was the end of that one. Um, right. I just came back and I was like, oh, shoot, oh, but such a great idea. And then from that, I morphed it into taking an automatic movement upside down so we could see that rotor and that, that battle axe rotor we'd already created, which I thought, I still think is and yeah. um and so um and the then it was wine. sorry you get the mega wine version of that as well where the, that was the, that was the that was the latest yeah, iteration later. but the, the first one had the battle axe uh, rotor yeah. turning around and um and then i had basically just two flat dials and i just thought ah flat dial no, no. i keep on advocating about 3d kinetic art and i'm putting a flat dial what can we do and then we've got the original sketch when i'm, I'm working with eric and i said oh, let's try and make it it's like a spaceship. Originally, again, it didn't start its life at all like a spaceship. Uh, it started off as I wanted to show the movement. And so we did those two cones, and, um, and that's how, we, that, that's how we, we ran with that. And uh, it's actually going to be in the history of MBNF, the, the, the best-selling reference ever, even to date. Wow. There were over... Seven years, I think over 500 HM3 variations because HM3 had a, a lot of different variations. We had the Star Cruiser, the Sidewinder, we had the Mega Wind, we had the Moon Machine, the Jewelry Machine, um, we Not had the, the, uh, the Frog, we yeah. had, uh, I mean, we had a that idea was such a great idea, at least I think so. <laughs> Sorry, uh, is that. Um, I actually it was so easy to come out with different variations. You didn't even have to scratch your, your head. It was like, well, oh, wouldn't it be cool if, which is very much the way we work is we have got the, wouldn't it be cool if process. Uh, and, um, and that's what defines the way we work. Uh, a lot of people sort of think we, we think this out a lot. We don't, we don't. We're very much a, um, a gut feeling knee jerk, wouldn't it be cool uh, sort of creative process. So that's yes. HM3. Amazing. Um, the four, as we discussed, was a, a quite an incredible watch. If I'm not mistaken, also a Geneva Grand Prix winning watch. Uh, for, and, and it was really, when you want, you want to talk about a piece of three-dimensional sculpture on your arm, you know, it, it basically looked like the fuselage of two planes about to take off on your wrist. And I remember you did one version of it where it actually even had these rivets um, that looked like an old World War II bomber plane yeah. and had, nose, had like nose art, you know, like those planes exactly. used to have as well. Right. I mean, when people, when people, when you came out with that, what did people think? Well, they, they, their reaction, I mean, the, our retail partners, at least their reaction was exactly the one I anticipated, which was, do you have something else? <laughs> and, and, um, and so uh, it, it's great. also why I often say defined me and my company because I was absolutely sure nobody was going to buy this piece. And I still went ahead and put every single cent we'd made over the, the years before into that incredible movement. It was uh, our first very completely integrated movement we developed. And um, um, the retailers just initially didn't get it. A few did, luckily, always a few do. I think we tell, we'd sold 12 pieces in Basel when we showed it. And um, uh, we needed to sell 100 over four years to amortize it. We need to craft and sell 100, so 25 a year. 
And then a miracle happened, and I've, I've told the story a few times, is that when we actually launched the piece, the launch was me in front of my computer sending emails to a few bloggers going, hey, uh, hey, this is what I've just come out with. Here are the photos. This is my HM4. Right. And um, uh, of course, the, the press loved it. I mean, the press yeah. adored it because it was so wacky, so wild, so out of the, out there. And um, and, and we're, let's not forget, we're 2010. We're, we're just coming out of 2009. We're still in an era of depression and right. of, of uh, rationality. And, yes. um, and so the press loved it. The blogs went crazy. And, um, and then suddenly the phone started ringing. Ooh. Suddenly the emails started coming in. Like, do, do you still have that crazy watch? I'm like, yeah. Well, I've got yes. a, a guy in the store. He wants to buy it. And, um, and actually, I don't believe there were virtually ever any HM4s in stock anywhere at any given time for four years. There were waiting lists on those pieces. And it sort of demonstrated to me that you could go wild. I was allowed to go wild. Um, not only, I think it's important, it's wild, but it's incredibly well made. The artisanship, the engineering, the watchmaking, because a lot of people look at our, our crazier HMs and go, oh, cool piece of design. If it was just a piece of design, it would have taken six months. It took four years. But the engineering and the watchmaking is insane. Um, right. And so I think all that came together and, and, and saved me. Uh, HM4 saved me. HM4 gave me the courage to do everything you've seen since. Uh, the HM6, the HM7 Aquapod, the, 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 the Bulldog, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, what it also taught me is that every time I'm really scared of one of my products, because I think, oh my God, now, 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 <laughs> now this time they're not going to follow me. And um, every time I do that, it's actually one of our um, easiest to sell pieces. Amazing. And, um, and that's, that's been a, a really big lesson in my life. Get out of your comfort zone. So, Do something so, that you're scared of. Now, now, let's go from that to something that people were not scared of, but also instantly fell in love, which, which was the legacy machines. Now, let me preface this by saying that it is not easy to design a kind of classic round watch as many brands have experienced, some perhaps more than others. Um, but, sorry, I didn't mean to go there. Oh, let's go there, come on. <laughs> but but the point is when you came out with this, it was, um, it, I mean, it just showed people that you could be in some ways very classic, have great sort of like respect to sort of ancient marine chronometers and, 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 and the watches that, you know, that we think of when we think of Auntie jean Bier or Harrison or any of those guys, but you created this all new design language for classic watchmaking that no one had ever seen before. I mean, tell us about the LMs because I absolutely adore them. And I think it's something that resonates really well with the world today. So the genesis against of the LM was not at all supposed to be around classic watch. Oh, it started off because I wanted to showcase the balance wheel. It's the beginning of my balance wheel fetishism. Uh, <laughs> I started with HM4, yeah. and which is 20 to 10, and LM1 was 2011. Right. And I am completely crazy about balance wheels and escapements because they're the most beautiful part of any watch. And we never oh, see it. them. And, um, and so I, um, I started designing a piece where you had a balance wheel, and then you had the hours and minutes, and then maybe you had the power reserve. It was like three cylinders. So absolutely not a legacy machine, not a classic watch. It was three cylinders. And whatever I designed, it looked one way or the other like a watch that virtually except everybody except probably you has forgotten, which was Vianney Halter's gold file piece unique. I love that. So yeah. In 2001, Vianney, for this whole gold file concept, I think one year, did a watch which was three cylinders yeah. with three dials in it. Yes. And whatever I did, because I wanted to have the, the, that balance wheel in its specific little world, ended up looking one way or the other like that. And with, with HGO again, uh, we were going crazy trying to design something which would not be 
linked in any way to what Vianney had done. Right. And after like a year of driving Eric crazy, one day at a meeting, I said, you know what? Okay, let's, let's just do a, a simple round watch where <laughs> you've got this flying balance wheel and, uh, and, and I, I sketch exactly what LM1 was going to be uh, with the two dials, like the two fur. And I'll say, it's going to be a tribute to classical watchmaking. And sort of Eric looked at me after a year and a half of designs in every single possibility, like completely disgusted. <laughs> and, 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 and I remember uh, Serge Kriknoff, our, our technical director, joined me 11 years ago. Um, right. said, um, 13 years, 13 years, 12 years, 12 years ago. Um, uh, looked at me and very respectfully said, Max, I, I, I didn't join the MBNF adventure to do a classical round watch. And, um, and so actually it was a massive battle internally with my team. It was like, wow, that's, that's really? the other guy. Yeah. Wow. And, um, but I, I just bulldozed ahead. And um, luckily for me, I didn't realize the risks we were taking. And today, you know, when you, you create something which is successful, everybody thinks it's normal that it's successful. Right. But you have to realize that in 2011, when we came out with LM1, we had started finally building the awareness of what we were trying to do, which was something completely different from the whole rest of the watch world. It was these kinetic sculpture machines. And we had fans. We had the beginning of our, our following. We had people who were like, yes, yes, that's it. That's what I want. And he's got it. He's understood what we want. And, um, and, and suddenly I come out with something classic and round. So it's not the, it's not the problem of disappointing the, the people who actually love what you do. That, you, you take that risk every year, every day. No. It was that most people in the industry were looking at us like, oh, yeah, the toy makers. That's not <laughs> watching. That's all those crazy little things like, oh, pfft because they didn't understand it, because they didn't take the time to understand it, because they didn't understand the watchmaking behind it. And right. now I was coming out with a round watch. And in round watches, you've got millions of specialists, millions of people who are self-declared masters of knowledge in classical watchmaking. So if when we came out with our very first classic watch, it had been half boring, or not incredibly finished, we would have millions of specialists who would have gone, oh, I told you, they have no idea how to do watchmaking. These guys just make toys. Right. And I luckily didn't realize the risk I was taking, because as usual, I don't think it out a lot. Uh, and, uh, and, so, um, and so we just presented LM1. Of course, we worked with these incredible uh, people. I mean, I will always remember, I'll always remember the moment I went to see Kari to try and convince him to work on that project. We'd never worked together. I'm, I was already an enormous fan of his work. I, I go up with uh, Serge Kriknoff and Jean-François Mojon, the engineer who was developing the movement with us. And I go and see Kari and um, say, so, Kari, um, uh, we're, we're going to create something very different from what you know uh, from MBNF. And I would really like you to work on this project. And I didn't show it to him. And he very politely declined. He said, look, I've, I've got way too much work. I can't, <laughs> small. I, I, I can't do this. Right. And I'm like, oh my God, we're all four or three of us looking at him around the table like, oh, no, 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 no. So a bit like in these, these Hollywood films, you sort of, you've got that moment where, so I just take out the drawing. I say, okay, I'm going to show you the drawing. Maybe can you just at least give me a few pointers where you think we should go? Right. And I show him the drawing, which was really very much, at least for the concept from the front, not the movement in the back, of course, what, what it is today. And he looks at this and he doesn't say anything for a moment. <laughs> then he takes a pencil and he goes, ah, you, ah, you could put the balance, the balance wheel like that, the screws like this, that, and oh, yeah, this would be nice. And, and he, he starts talking with himself like for like five minutes, sketching on my design. And, um, and then suddenly he stops. He looks up 
And I look at him and I say, uh, Kari, does, does that mean you're going to actually do it? And he cracks up with this enormous smile and he says, this, this I'm going to do. And I, I've got goosebumps. I, 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 that, 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 again, those, those are incredible souvenirs. Those are, those are moments. I live for those moments. Um, so, so th there you go. Th that's that's part of the beginning of legacy one. Again, clueless, no strategy, no idea what the hell we're doing, no idea of the risks we're taking. We just wanted to try this out and want to do something we're proud of. Amazing. So let's uh, go from there to um, the horological machine at number ten, um, the bulldog, because in some way it kind of merges uh, the language of uh, and your obsession with the balance wheel. Um, as well as, as the language of a little bit of a, a, a kind of plan d'oeil or a, a nod to the HM3, perhaps, as well, you know, with the indicators similar to the frog. Tell us a little bit about this watch and, and you know, and how you feel this is in some ways a symbol of your journey. Uh, I, what's incredible with this piece, with the HM10 Bulldog, is that I procrastinated on that creation for years. I procrastinated because I thought it was not serious enough. It was maybe a little bit too trivial, the concept. And again, karma, it comes out on 24th of March when the whole world is down. And we right. debated a lot internally. Are we going to actually present this piece in, in, in this horrible moment of the humanity? And I said, well, you know what? This piece has made everybody I've shown it to smile. Let's try and we got an avalanche, an avalanche of messages of people saying, thanks, guys. You made our week. It was the highlight of our week. Um, so interestingly enough, I, I pushed over HM10, which I actually imagined five years ago. It didn't take five years to develop. It took about three, three and a half. But I kept on pushing it over and putting other projects which seemed more important before. But I realized today, well, actually, I realized yesterday um, how important the bulldog is for us and why it's important. I think, um, I think it's a symbol of who I have become over the years. Remember I told you there was a lot of anger when I created MBNF, anger against myself, anger against the industry. I was a, you've known me. I've been a very angry man for a very long time, even though I try and stay polite. Um, there, uh, and... And then um, eight years ago, I, uh, I met my wife-to-be, nine years ago now. And, um, and seven years ago, we had our first daughter and, and three years ago, our second. And uh, I took all sorts of decisions in, in MBNF, like the one in 2013, uh, seven years ago, to stop growing and, and to, to try and have more balance in my life. And I am much, much, much less angry than I ever was. I'm much more balanced. I'm much happier. I am, um, and my creative process has been impacted by that. Uh, I am not, uh, in French you say la revendication. How do you say that? La revendication uh, in English. Um, everything, I, every time I created something, it was, I, I, tried, I was wanting to make a statement. Right. This was it. Um, now it's not about that. Yes. It's about being happy. It's about enjoying on myself. Right. There is a factor about of joy. Yes. And, and I think the bulldog is exactly that. And the story, which is absolutely true, and I have no other story to tell. Usually I've got a great idea, a story of how a product comes to life, but bulldog, boom, came into my mind <laughs> like this. Um, and it's the first time it happened to me. Before I used to sketch a lot, and it, five years ago, I was in, uh, in actually the, the bus going from the hotel uh, in, in Tokyo to Narita Airport, completely jet lagged at 6.30 in the morning. I'm like, uh, dozing away. And yes. boom, I see what is more or less going to be the bulldog. I see the head, I see the jaws. I was like, ah, whoa, whoa. And I sort of try and capture that piece and start then sketch from my, my vision. And then when I arrive back in Geneva, I sit down with my team and, uh, and Eric and like, oh, this is the idea and the, the big head and the, and the legs and, and the jaws opening up and everybody's like, what's he about? And, um, and, um, 
it started off like that. So I think it's a, it's, it's, it's an emanation of me being a much more balanced and, and happy creator. It's Amazing. also the first time I'm going to see something in my mind. And since then, virtually everything you've seen has been imagined in my mind without sketching. I don't virtually know sketch anymore. And, um, and um, it's only along the process that I realized that it was like, uh, like you know, when, it, when you're, um, when you're uh, a, a singer, artist, uh, a band, you have the best of, which comes out after 10 or 15 years, your, yes. your best songs. Of course. <laughs> well, Bulldog, without doing it on purpose, is my best of. It's, um, it's got the eyes of the frog. It's got the flying balance wheel of the legacy machine. It's got the three-dimensional power reserve uh, indicator of the legacy machine we've created. It's got the attachments of the HM4. It's got the, um, the two crowns which we inaugurated with the aquapod and the flying T. Um, and, and you've got, and of course, it's got this kinetic 3D uh, spaceship. It, I, even when I don't want to do a spaceship, I friggin' do a spaceship. And, um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's a symbol of my journey. Amazing. I love it. Um, uh, Max, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I would like to just mention, so there's a guy who is on Instagram right now named, I guess he goes by Perfect Shadow, and he's a, a doctor at 6.40 in the morning um, going to uh, a COVID ward to take care of people. And he says that this is a great start to his day. So I think that that's, that let's dedicate this to him. And then I guess the last question I have for you would be, so, you know, you launched this in a, in a time where the world is in this, this terrible crisis. Um, how has the response been? And, and if, I'm, if I might ask from a business perspective, are people still buying watches? Um, we, <laughs> one of the many reasons we did launch um, was that we'd actually already delivered 15 of those bulldogs to our retailers before the launch. Um, and because we actually in January, because Watches and Wonders slash SIHH had, I was not in January anymore, we went around the world and presented it already to some of our VIP customers and of course my retailers, etc. So a lot of, actually virtually all those 15 pieces were pre-sold. And as we delivered them, now the retailers who are going into shutdown are saying, Max, I've, I've got the watch. The client wants it, but I can't deliver it to him because you haven't launched it. And, and, um, and so that was also economically one of the reasons we did it. And I must admit, we were bracing for uh, some shaming. We were bracing for the people who are like, oh, how dare you talk about watches in this moment? And it didn't happen. Yes. And again, proves that when you think you're doing something right, when you're ben ben benevolent, you say, uh, yeah. when you're caring, um, when, you're, when you're actually um, trying to do good, because that's, we're not saving lives. I've been battling with that the biggest part of my life. We're, we're watch creators. But what we do, we save and we make the lives better of the people who actually engineered it, crafted it manufactured these pieces, all these artisans who work around it. We're giving them a, a livelihood. And um, that's what I do. I'm not a doctor, unfortunately. I'm not there to save lives, but I can only help the lives of the people around the MBNF story. And that's what I do. So the, the bulldog is helping them. And if, if a few people found it cool, a few pay, it made people smile, it made their day better, well, I did my little, little, little part in that story. Max, I absolutely agree. And, you know, I, I, I agree with you also is that, I mean, in, just based on what we do for livings, you know, we're not really capable of particularly helping anyone in the direct way, you know, and, and, I, and there's nothing that I have greater respect for. And if I could go out my balcony and, and, and clap every night for the people that are, are working um, so uh, selflessly to sort of fight this up pandemic. But I guess in times like this, People also need to see, you know, um, beauty and they need to have dreams as well. And I think that's exactly what you provided them with, uh, with everything you've done, but in particular, this new watch. And I hope that when we look back at this time, and I hope that that's sooner rather than later, um, we'll think of, of, of the Bulldog as, as a wonderful reminder that, that there was uh, still this beautiful human spirit of creativity and light in a time that was dark. So thank you very much, Max. Let's do a virtual high uh, fist bump.
There we Boom. go. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. It was great Thank talking you. to you and have a wonderful day and uh, stay safe and best to your family. One of you too. Take care. Take care, brother. Bye.